So in an effort to learn reinforcement learning, I recently built this visual maze solving system. This essentially amounted to training a convolutional neural net using reinforcement learning. The only input to this neural net was this image of a maze, or rather a grid-like world with some obstacles and a start and end point for an agent to follow. I built a convolutional net for it. You can see some of the intermediate outputs of the first two layers here. Then there's a dense layer, and after that another dense layer that ends in four values. These four values are supposed to represent the total reward that this agent, which is essentially the neural net manifesting itself as the box in red, would get by taking any one of four actions, which are mapped to going up, down, left, and right. What you're seeing here in this GIF file is this neural net in action solving one of the randomly generated mazes and showing which actions it decided to take and how the image was broken down into these convolutional features. This network was trained to solve mazes anywhere between 3x3 three three and 6x6 six six in size. And as you can see, it seems to solve a 4x4 four four maze correctly as well, and somewhat more complicated looking 6x6 six six mazes. And in this simulation or game where the neural net can move the box, it is actually possible for it to encounter what I call a death state by moving into one of these obstacles. That is considered a valid move, and the agent gets a reward of negative 1 for doing that. Not only is this neural net able to solve these mazes, it is also able to recognize when a solution does not exist, and instead of killing itself, it just keeps oscillating back and forth. Right here is another example of that, where a lot of the path towards the final goal is actually free, so the agent gets really close to the final goal and then just oscillates back and forth. And then like with any neural net that you get impatient with and don't continue training, every once in a while it runs into some really weird failures where it's not able to go any further than the initial few steps and then just gets stuck in these oscillations. Now this system was built as part of a couple of live streams, the first one of which was about constructing and solving a very simple version of this problem where the maze itself was not randomized and was fixed, and we used standard Q learning in order to solve that problem. From there I wanted to build a more general system, and that's why I turned to deep reinforcement learning. This was the topic of live stream number two, and as any that were actually present for that live stream might remember, I was unable to actually solve this problem during the live stream. So the purpose of this video is to first summarize what I was trying to do in the live stream, and then show every single thing that I did wrong while trying to build this deep reinforcement learning system, as well as show you how I fixed it, so that if anybody watching is interested in pursuing deep reinforcement learning on their own, they know not to make these mistakes as well. So let's get started with that. What I'm showing on the screen right now is the old code, which is the code that I had at the end of the second live stream, on the window on the right, and that's why the window on the right has a theme that looks kind of like old-timey, whereas the window on the left that appears to have a more modern, more fancy-looking theme actually contains the current version of the code where all the mistakes have been fixed. So let's first start with what I had at the end of live stream number two. This being a deep reinforcement learning problem, we first put together a convolutional net that would serve as the agent. That is being done in this function called create maze solving network. It takes two arguments, the image size and the number of actions, which in this case is four, and I chose the image size to be 64. This is a fairly arbitrary choice. I believe that image could have been much smaller as well and things would have been fine, but I haven't really tried that. I decided to go with a fairly straightforward architecture, which was to some extent inspired by 2015's Atari paper from DeepMind. There's two convolutional layers, each followed by their own max pooling layer. Then I flattened the result, put it through a dense layer of size 64, and then put it through another dense layer of size number of actions. One thing I discovered way later on is that somehow choosing sigmoid as the activation in this first dense layer was really bad and it was making the network really, really difficult to train. So that was one of the things that was fixed after the live stream. I also added a few nice helpers for pre-processing the image as well as running a prediction on this model so that we can easily use it inside the simulation as well. Speaking of the simulation, that is done in this maze.py file. There's a class that tracks the agent itself, and another class that defines the maze, keeps the maze state as a numpy array, allows us to apply the four actions going from an index of zero to four, and then also computing a score for each move, where if the agent actually succeeds, it gets the win score, and if the agent runs into one of the obstacles, it gets the death score. This is where I made a second mistake, where I gave the win score a value of 100 and a death score a value of negative 10. Both of these are way higher than one, and I believe that this also made the neural net much more difficult to train. Changing these values to simply a one and negative one, and then decreasing the score that's given at every single step, 
ended up stabilizing a lot of things. Finally, this maze class contains a function called toImage, which just creates the image that we saw in the GIF and returns it. The overall strategy for running the training involved running the simulation a very large number of times. So here's a helper function called runEpisode to make that a little bit easier. It takes as an input a maze, a model, a probability threshold that is used to pick either a random action or the neural net to pick our next action, as well as a running doubly linked list that is just serving as a memory. And we'll talk in a second what the memory is useful for. So during the episode, we simply run the agent, decide whether we want a random action or one sampled from the neural net, and then create an instance of this data class called single step, which holds on to the current state, which is just the image, the next state, which is the image after the action is taken, the reward for this one step, as well as the action that was taken to get that reward, and then a final variable that just indicates whether or not the game had ended. This function is then called from our main function, where we allocate a large memory, create a model, set the grid size, make a maze, and then inside a loop, we start running this training procedure. Now there is some level of bootstrapping required for this memory. It needs to have sufficient samples before the neural net training can start. I initially picked that value to be 500, but later learned that it should actually be much higher than that. So once the memory has filled to some known amount, we sample a single batch of steps from it, and then generate the inputs and outputs for the neural net. Now the input in this case is relatively straightforward. We're just taking the image that the maze produced at that particular step and appending that to the inputs. The output on the other hand is a little bit more involved. Since the neural network is essentially standing in as an approximation for the Q function, it should, for reinforcement learning, follow the Bellman equation. As such, the Q value of taking the current action should be equal to the current reward plus the best Q value expected from future actions. This is the fundamental idea that is used to construct the output for this neural net, and this is where I made the biggest mistake in the live stream. The Q values for the future action should come from predicting on the neural net using the future state's image. If the episode had finished, then the target is relatively straightforward. It is equal to just the reward. However, if the episode had not finished, then it should be equal to the reward plus some discount factor times the max Q value that we can expect from this target vector, which is just the neural network predicted at the next state. This is all fine, but where I made the biggest mistake was taking this target vector and then simply setting the value at the index of the action taken equal to this target that we computed above, and then passing that as the outputs of the neural net. Now, if you had watched the live stream, you will remember that I was really, really confused about this point, and I wasn't sure how to do this correctly. The reason for that is that Keras, which is the neural network library that I'm using here, doesn't really let you define custom loss functions in an easy way. And as such, would have only taken a vector as an input for the output, and would have compared it to the output of the neural net that it already had. This does not create a correct comparison, because this comparison is only supposed to happen for the action taken. Whereas here, we would be taking the mean squared error for the entire target vector with the entire output of the neural net at the current state. So this is straight up false. I had gotten this idea from this Towards Data Science article. So in the future, if you're also stuck in something similar and you end up at that Towards Data Science article, just remember this video and ignore it. Now, before I talked about how this was fixed, let's move on to the rest of the process. The rest is relatively straightforward. For every single iteration, we run a single epoch of fitting the model. And then at some interval, I was also running a visualization cycle so that I could see qualitatively if the model was learning anything or not. And as you can see from roughly two hours into my live stream, the model was not learning anything. So that's roughly when I decided to cut the live stream and spend some time learning a little bit more and trying to figure out the mistakes that I had made. So let's now go to the new code and go over the changes. First of all, in the construction of the neural net, I ended up adding a third convolutional layer. I don't know if this ultimately really makes a difference for a problem this simple, but it was working, so it's there. I also changed the activation of this second to last dense layer to linear instead of sigmoid. Now, as I scroll down in this file, you'll see a number of new functions. And the most important function here is this one, add RL loss to network. As I mentioned, Keras doesn't really let you define custom loss functions. So you kind of have to take a sideways approach to do that. Here, we're doing that by wrapping the model inside another model where the inputs not only contain the image, but also contain the actual output that you're supposed to have. 
the total reward value, the target value. They also contain a mask vector, which is one for the action that was taken, and then zero everywhere else. Then we stack a final layer onto the network, which is supposed to actually just compute the loss. It calls this very simple function called masked MSC up here, and all that function is doing is computing the mean squared error, but then before actually doing a sum, just multiplying it by the mask so that everything not related to the current action gets set to zero. As far as I know, this is the correct way of doing the loss for deep reinforcement learning, and this is the only real way that you can achieve this in Keras. For more reference, feel free to peruse the source code of the Keras-RL package, something that I probably should be using in the future as I continue doing more reinforcement learning work. So getting back to this lambda layer, it takes as its input the actual target value that the network is supposed to reach, the original output of the network, and then finally this mask, which as you know, is supplied as an input. So effectively, we're adding two inputs that are only there so they can end up inside this final lambda layer. We then create this new model called trainable model, which as I said, simply wraps the old model in these new inputs and outputs. This is the only model that gets trained in this entire process. Now, as I scroll further down, there are a number of other functions. I'm not really gonna go over these intermediate models and visualization functions. I'll link this repository in the description. So if somebody's curious about these functions, they can go check it out. These are the functions that I used to make the GIF that I was showing in the beginning. The only other function that I'm actually gonna go over in detail is this one called transfer weights partially. All this function is supposed to do is take a source network and a target network that both have the same architecture, and then given some fractional value, update the weights of the target network to be closer to the weights of the source network. If LR is equal to one, then the target network gets copied exactly to the source network. Now allow me to explain why I'm doing this. One of the things that people at DeepMind discovered when they were trying to get deep reinforcement learning to work was that using the same network for training and prediction in this entire process was inherently unstable and didn't really work for anything but the smallest of problems. As it turns out, this is a really simple concept, but it took me forever to figure this out. In a standard supervised learning problem, when you compute a loss for a neural network, it is computed by giving it inputs that always have the same value. A cat is always a cat. So in one epoch, when the neural network encounters that particular example, it can change its weights to produce an output closer to the output that, was, that it was supposed to be. And then in the next step again, the output remains the same. So the neural network knows which direction to continue moving in terms of changing its weights. This fundamental assumption breaks in deep reinforcement learning if you're only using one network, because every time the parameters off the neural net change, the target values also change. So to fix this, we actually create two models, a standard model and a target model. The model that we're going to be training is built off of the normal model, we then go ahead and have a much longer bootstrapping session where we're filling the entire memory, which in this case is 50,000 examples. And then as we run each epoch of training, we use the current model to predict on the current state and the target model to predict on the future state. This means that the reward plus maximum future reward part of the loss function always comes from the target model, which remains fixed for a long time. Also note now that in, in addition to inputs and outputs, now we also have these masks, which are passed counterintuitively, not into the expected output of this network, but the input that is going into this network. That's okay. That's just a trick that we have to play in order to get Keras to work in a reasonable fashion. You'll also see these TB writes written everywhere in this function. That's because while I was working on these experiments and trying to get everything to work, I, for the first time in my life, finally understood the reason that TensorBoard exists. And so TB write is just a wrapper around TensorBoard summary writing functionality. And I used it very extensively when I was trying to tune hyperparameters for this problem. So then we keep this training running over and over again. And then every n steps, in my case, I chose those to be 50. I've been told that this number should actually be a lot higher, but things worked out for me. All that we do now is that we copy the weights from the current network to the target network, and then for my own edification and qualitative analysis, I'm running a test episode to see if the neural network has learned anything or not. And that's the crux of it. The biggest mistakes that I made in this process was A, not using a target model, and B, computing the loss completely incorrectly inside Keras. I also made a third mistake, which was expecting the system to train in a timely fashion inside a live stream. After everything was set up correctly, it still took roughly four to five hours for the neural net to get trained well enough so that it can solve mazes the way you can see now. 
Now, some of it might just have to do with the fact that I was running all the computations on CPU, but it does tell me that I need a lot more preparation for future live streams, as well as making sure that I pick small enough problems to where they can actually be trained and evaluating during a live stream and not in a follow-up video like today. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you all learned something useful today and are able to learn from my mistake. If you ever decide to pursue the honestly really fantastic world of deep reinforcement learning, I will be continuing to do deep reinforcement learning work on the channel, mostly as live streams. The next live stream is probably going to be about solving a very similar problem using policy optimization, which is actually a way of doing reinforcement learning that's completely different from Q-learning and is supposed to actually converge faster in many situations. One of the reasons why I want to move to policy optimization also is because it lends itself really well to continuous time problems. And so two live streams from now, I actually want to tackle a problem that could be close to an actual real world problem and train a robot in simulation to find a docking location and then dock correctly into it. I hope you guys continue watching my live streams. Thank you very much for watching this video again. If you liked it, please leave a like. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my channel. Until next time, bye.